Good evening, everyone. I'm Alan Holman. I am the curator at the Hampton History Museum, and welcome to our virtual Port Hampton lecture for the evening. Uh, we will continue to meet uh, in this format until times are better, but we hope to see you soon in person here in our great hall. I want to uh, announce, uh, make a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, one is our next virtual event, and it will be our virtual front porch series, uh, Wednesday, November 18th, between seven and eight o'clock. Again, on Facebook Live, just like today. Uh, Rob Oliver, uh, who has graced our stage uh, performing with other area talent in recent years. And we are excited to have him return and share his original music. He is a multi-instrumentalist, vocalist, and songwriter who specializes in guitar and harmonica. And he released an acclaimed album, uh, Highs and Lows and Blues in February. So join us again, Wednesday the 18th, uh, seven to eight o'clock, same format. Uh, this evening, we have uh, Scott Dawson. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Scott, uh, who's gonna talk to us a little bit about uh, the Lost Colony, uh, which may not be so lost anymore. Uh, Scott Dawson is a native of Hatteras Island, whose family's uh, roots of the island trace back to the 1600s. He is a well-known local historian, author, and amateur archaeologist. He is president and founder of the Croatoan Archaeological Society and has participated in a decade of archaeological excavations and research on Hatteras Island under the direction of Dr. Mark Horton. He also serves on the board of directors of the Outer Banks History Center. He's a graduate of the University of Tennessee with a BA in psychology and a minor in history. He lives with his wife, Maggie, and two daughters, Kira and Sabra, on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. He's an avid surfer and loves all things outdoors. Uh, he's an active in his community as a volunteer firefighter, EMT, teacher at the College of the Albemarle, youth soccer coach, and historical public speaker. Uh, we have his book, uh, The Lost Colony in Hatteras Island, which he'll be bringing us up to speed on this evening. We have it in our gift store. So feel free to drop by if you're in Hampton and pick up a copy. Uh, and I, I will say this, uh, we're having a little bit of a technical glitch as we have, this one is a, a different one. We have a new technical glitch. Scott is on the Outer Banks and they're having a pretty severe storm right now. So his, uh, his signal isn't the strongest. So where you don't find Scott, uh, we are able to get his uh, PowerPoint presentation through at a better uh, resolution. So if you don't see Scott, you will see his PowerPoint presentation. So I'm going to turn it over to Scott now. Scott. Person on the screen, but um, you should be fine once I get to the PowerPoint. Can you hear me? Yes, Scott, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump right into this then. So, there you go. So I'm excited to talk to you guys about the lost colony. They've been missing since 1587. It's over 430 years, um, 20 years before Jamestown, and um, long before Plymouth. And we have found evidence that they assimilated with the Croatoan Indians on Hatteras Island, which um, has always been kind of the leading theory. And, and I'd uh, like to take this opportunity to clear up a lot of mythologies. Um, like a lot of uh, parts of history, when popular fiction takes hold of any part of history, you end up with a mountain of mythology on top of it like you have with um, the movie Braveheart is an awesome movie, not historically accurate at all, or Walt Disney's Pocahontas or sort, you know, um, the sword and the stone and what they did with King Arthur or Robin Hood, Billy the Kid, Blackbeard. There's all kinds of um, real histories that get completely overshadowed by Disney and, uh, other media and in this case is no different. The Lost Colony is forever um, dominated by the Lost Colony play narrative, which is 100% incorrect. Um, one of the biggest misconceptions, and, it, and this is taught in school, it's not just a problem of um, fiction because this is being taught in schools, is that the colony was um, completely 
vanished without a clue except for this cryptic message Croatoan written on a tree. And they kind of leave it at that and they, they pretend that no one knows what the word Croatoan means. And this is incorrect. Um, Doc, we have over nine. For, sure. I'm going to interrupt you for just a second. Would you mind uh, sharing your, uh, your presentation screen? I thought I had. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. We do not have that. All right. Well, let's fix that problem then. Um, let's see. So. Well. Can you see it now? There we have it. All right. Well, this will make a lot more sense now, guys. I'll, I guess I'll go back to the beginning. But um, so the word Croatoan is the old name of Hatteras Island and is clearly labeled on the 16th century maps. We have over 900 pages of documents talking about the Croatoan people. There were Croatoan men that traveled to England. One of them went back and forth from the New World to England twice. His name was Manio. Um, a lot of people assume that the natives Manio and Wanchis were from Roanoke Island because there are towns on Roanoke Island today named after these guys, but neither one of them was from Roanoke Island. They never fought each other, and neither one of them was a chief. These are all kind of uh, myths that come out of the Lost Colony play. But they are real people, and they, they do play a major role in history. And so we're, I'm going to go through some of the real history, and then I will present the archaeology and the exciting finds that we've dug out of the ground because it is an amazing, amazing discovery, and I'm very thankful to a lot of people. So... In the 16th century, the most powerful nation in the world was Spain, by far. The Spanish got this way in part from all the wealth that they got from the New World. Christopher Columbus landed in the Bahamas. He was never in the continental United States, but he did go to Cuba. He did go to the Bahamas. He did go to Haiti, and he did find gold and quickly uh, brutalized the American Indians there. And um, he even wrote a letter to King Ferdinand describing in detail how he beat a young 14-year-old girl with a tarred rope and raped her. So Columbus is a pretty horrible person, but his discovery is still a very, very significant discovery. And the, um, the monks, the Spanish monk Bartholomew de las Casas, he was one of the people that witnessed all the atrocities that Columbus and his men were doing. And not all the Spanish were evil. So he spoke out against it, and a lot of his works were translated into several different languages. And the English got a hold of this, and there were men like Richard Hocklut, who was the court historian to Queen Elizabeth, who wanted to do a completely opposite um, colony of what the Spanish did. They had dreams of coming to the New World and befriending the Native Americans and living amongst them as, as friends, learning their language, learning what they could about the, the local plants and resources, and trying to you know, do the opposite of Spain. They also thought that this would be a better way to spread um, Christianity than at the barrel of a gun. So they presented the queen uh, with a huge document basically arguing for why she should fund a colony and the queen is at war with spain and a and a double proxy war that's not an all-out war between england and spain yet what i mean by that is the spanish had taken over the netherlands and the netherlands were rebelling against the spanish rule and the English were giving the people in the Netherlands guns and horses and money to fight the Spanish, but they were not sending English troops. They did everything short of that. And Spain, in turn, did the same thing to the English in Ireland because the English were conquering Ireland. And a lot of the Irish were Catholics, so Spain was giving them guns and horses and money. And everybody knew that a war between Spain and England was going to happen. They were already uh, pirating each other on the high seas, and they had this double proxy war going. The Queen's got a very personal um, hatred of King Philip II as well, 
As you may know, he was married to the infamous Bloody Mary, which is the queen's older half-sister. So they've got the age-old Catholic versus Protestant thing going on, but they are also got a lot of economic goals. In Spain, getting all this wealth out of the New World is raising larger and larger navy, larger and larger army, getting mercenaries out of Italy. And the uh, way to combat this, the English argued, was to go to the New World and find a good place to pirate Spanish ships. They wanted to get the Spanish ships on their way back to Spain because those were the ships full of gold and silver. If you got the Spanish on their way to the New World, you would just get regular stuff, tools, clothes, nothing great. So the queen agreed to do this, but she didn't do it openly. They were allowed to do it, and she would give them some gunpowder and a ship, and she would finance it in part, but they had to finance a lot of it on their own with private investors, and if they got caught, they were just pirates and they'd hang for it. But if they did not get caught, she would get 10% of whatever they took. So it's the kind of the birth of plausible deniability. So before you have Sir Walter Raleigh and all those guys that you've heard of, you have Sir Humphrey Gilbert, 1577. And the, he was the first person to get a patent from the Queen to try this out. And Gilbert was very interested in finding a Northwest Passage to China. It is something that they continue to do all the way up to Lewis and Clark. They're looking for a Northwest Passage. Those guys followed the Missouri River to find where the source of water was and ended up being a bunch of snow in the Rocky Mountains. But at any rate, Gilbert, he never comes to what's now the United States, but he does go to Canada. And his first two voyages were very unproductive. Um, he did meet with some natives in Newfoundland and, and Nova Scotia and really didn't amount to much of anything. His third and last voyage, he drowned. He was on a ship called the Squirrel, and a storm came and swallowed him up. Also on that voyage was Sir Walter Raleigh. But the ship that Raleigh was on turned around before the storm hit because they didn't have enough victuals. They didn't have enough food. So it's probably a good thing they didn't because Raleigh would have drowned as well as everybody else died. So when this happened, Raleigh got the patent. And Raleigh's got a different idea than Gilbert. He doesn't really care so much about trying to find a <clears throat> Northwest Passage. He's more concerned with sticking it to Spain. So what happens is he sends a recon mission in 1584 to find a place to loot Spanish ships. That's the number one goal. Any profitable resources, not just gold, it could be something as simple as lumber, like anything. And then trade with the natives. They knew from the French who had been in South Carolina and other places and from the Spanish who had been in Florida and all over that the natives desired any kind of iron tools, any kind of copper or glass trinkets, and they would trade whatever they had for it. So whatever the natives met, they met, whatever they had to trade, that's they were going to try to make a profit that way. There's no women in this colony, not in 1584. It's all military guys. They did not land on Roanoke Island. They were on Hatteras Island. So the first place an English person ever set foot in what's now the United States was in Buxton on Hatteras Island. And this is where they will meet Manio and Wanchis, neither of which was a chief. And they're going to follow the northern equatorial current through the Caribbean, which the Spanish had a lot of strongholds and they had forts built. So they can't really pick an island in the Caribbean because the Spanish would find them immediately and slaughter them all. Just as the they had done to the French in the 1560s in what's now Charleston, South Carolina. So they link up with a Gulf Stream current. And the Gulf Stream never comes closer to land than at Cape Hatteras. This is a map from NASA. And you can see the orange and yellow. That's the warmer water. And it comes right up here by Hatteras Island, which was called Croatoan at the time. It's the perfect place to pirate ships. The unique shape bent at a right angle makes it to where you can rob ships, whether they're coming from the north or the south. You can see them and they can't see you. And it's basically like somebody walking around a corner of a hallway and getting punched in the mouth as soon as they come around that corner That because of the shape. And because it's next to the Gulf Stream, they can sit up and watch the ships coming. 
and they keep their own ships on the other side of the point. And as, as soon as they walk around or sail around that corner, they get jacked. So they found a perfect place to pirate. When they got there, they came in through an inlet, which is gone now um, north of Buxton and probably open up again soon. It's called Chancandepico. Chancandepico means that which is deep and becomes shallow. And they came into that inlet and took a left and they landed in the vicinity of Cape Hatteras School, which is the middle and high school are in the same building. And when I went there, it was K through 12, but they landed in that area. Um, three Harkibus shots into the inlet. So that's, that's about where that would put them. We don't know exactly where they landed, but that's where they went. And when they got there, of course, they met the Croatoan Indians. And now I want to talk a little bit about what was going on over here. So two years before the English arrived in 1584, there was a war between the Croatoan on Hatteras Island and the Secotan who lived around modern day Madame Mesquite Lake, um, Mans Harbor, and it's like Scranton, North Carolina, almost all, pretty much just shy of getting a bath and along the northern bank of the Pamlico River and the modern day parts of uh, Terrell County, like Columbia, and the mainland part of Dare, Stumpy Point and all that. So the Sequitin and the Croatoan hated each other. And they had it just ended a war in 1582. And to celebrate this war ending, the Croatoan invited the Sequitin chief and a bunch of his verwances, like a, the council, their government, and their best guys, to come over and celebrate. And they did. And they had a feast and they were dancing. And after the feast and the dancing, which went well into the night, the Croatoan went into the matricomics, which are, is a temple where they would pray to an ancestral god called Kibos. And you're not allowed to have weapons in the temple. It's kind of like you can't have guns inside a church unless you're in Texas, apparently. But the Sequitin had hidden weapons. And when the Croatoan went into the temple, they followed him in there and, and slaughtered a bunch of them. And it took about 30 women as slaves back across the sound. So the Croatoan were still really angry about this. And when they met the English and they saw the armor and they saw them demonstrate their guns, they begged them to attack the Sekotan and said, if you do, we'll give you all the pearls and all the deer skins and tobacco, whatever. We just want to kill them. We just want revenge. You can keep all the plunder. And the English had no interest in this yet. <laughs> um, they they declined to do that because they didn't come over here to get in an Indian war. They came over here to loot the Spanish and trade. And that honeymoon period won't last very long. But for that first voyage in 1584, everything is smooth. They don't fight with anybody. But the stage is kind of set. So the natives are living in these long houses. And when I say long, it's not so much like this, this picture here. Some of them are 60 feet long. A lot of them are like 25, but some of them are, are quite long. And they're just saplings, and they're tied off at the center, and they have fire pits in the middle. Um, they're two stories. They kind of had like these really long, wide benches on both sides. And then the middle part is like a hallway that was open. Um, you can see replicas of these when you visit Jamestown. They're pretty much the same thing. The ones on Hatteras Island are a little bit more football shaped. They're almost an oval, uh, whereas the ones in Jamestown are kind of uh, straight on the sides. And we're not real sure why that is, but it might be because Hatteras is so windy. That's the going theory. Um, they had weir nets, which is where pound netting comes from, and they could get fish very easily in the sound. They had very large gardens, I w nothing that w you would call a farm by today's standards, but very, very large gardens. And they were growing corn and squash and beans and pumpkins and cucumbers and sunflowers. And we find all these seeds on our dig. In the upper right here is a picture of a midden, which is full of uh, deer bones and shellfish and lots and lots of turtle bone, which is kind of surprising how much turtle they ate. There's more turtle bone than deer or fish or anything else. The only thing that there's uh, more of than the turtle bone are the shellfish, which they must have eaten every day. And you can tell from the shellfish that they were living on the island year round because you have the ones from all, all of the seasons, which um, this is a John White painting of a Sequitin village over here. 
uh, looks basically like what we find on Croatoan. The longhouses are kind of scattered all over the place. And then you've got, um, he's representing how they would eat together outside and pray together and dance together. Everything was communal. These villages were small enough that you basically got 12 giant clan families. So uh, it's basically like Kinnikeet today. Um, this is the, some of the canoes they were making. An artist added this uh, bit where they lifted the canoe off the ground like that. That didn't happen. When they were burning the canoes, because they don't have iron to scrape it out, they would put tar or, I mean, they put pitch. So you get sap from a tree and cook it up in a clay pot and it makes what looks like tar, but it's um, pitch. And it lights like gasoline. If you light it on fire, it just roars. And they would actually have the canoe on the ground and they would pack the sides with mud or clay because otherwise you're going to burn the whole thing. And once you get it hollowed out a little bit, then you can um, not worry so much about packing the sides in the bottom of clay and just, just burn and scrape and burn and scrape. And to scrape, they're using antler, they're using shell, they're using bone. So you can understand why uh, they would love to get a hold of a hatchet. Um, makes that work a lot easier. And it, they use these more in the sound than in the ocean because we have waves at Hatteras. And, uh, some of them were capable of holding over 20 people. And you, you find this again in Jamestown where they talk about some of they're basically trees, these giant trees that they burn down. So some of them, the large ones they would use as a trade vessel to go across the sound and trade with somebody and load up with goods. And then the ones you see on the right, the smaller ones, which are a lot more maneuverable and more sensible for fishing, they used for fishing. So this is a whelk shell hoe actually has a uh, it's called a rashaquan i had a list of algonquin words in the classroom when i was teaching in middle school and they honed in on that word right away because it says ho it's a ho for farming rashaquan um so i should have seen that coming uh the whelk shell it always has this hole in it it's kind of shaped like the goggles that somebody uses when they're um scuba diving and it's got a little notch in it where the wooden handle would go in and just kind of snap in like a Lego. And then, of course, they tied it with cordage. And you, normally you have this great big beak coming off of it like you do with a well, any whelk or conch. And it's always smoothed down and worn down because that's the side they were using to till the soil. So, again, you can see why they would want an iron hoe as opposed to this shell. Um, but it actually works pretty well. Uh, we tried it. And this is smooth as a baby's bottom on the other side. And we've got, I don't know, I think 23 of these that we found so far. Um, this is the match of common gauze talking about. They would keep their dead um, about 10 feet off the ground because they're, you don't want the animals getting at them. And that little man that you see is actually a statue called Kibos. And he was painted red and black in the, um, the hat is is actually a top knot haircut it's not a hat and they they believe that you should bury the dead all at the same time um at the solstice the summer solstice so keep all the dead in this matricomic and then when that day came they would remove the bones from the flesh and they'd polish them with bear grease and they would bury them all together there was one found in 1974 in hatter's village it had a minimum number of 110 skeletons in it, and there was some order to it, um, and I'll, I'll get to that when I get to the question section. They did have a creation story. They did believe in hell, which is called Popogoso. Um, their creation story is, is a lot like all over the world, um, where you have one chief god, one paramount god, but he made or it made demigods smaller gods to manage to help manage the universe and we were considered the water world and they believed the world was a sphere of water which isn't too far off and that um if you behaved in life then when you died they did believe in life after death and you could go to heaven which is much like heaven from judaism or christianity or islam it's just paradise and they believed in hell but their hell was not fire and brimstone. It was a pit of darkness and freezing cold. And you could graduate from hell, but you could also get kicked out of heaven. So you had to keep being good even after you died. Um, 
So the second voyage that comes over uh, is financed by leather merchants for the most part. Of all the goods they brought back in 1584, it was the leather that was the most impressive. So six of the seven ships are going to be owned by leather merchants. And the largest ship was called the Tiger. It was going to be owned by Queen Elizabeth. It was built by her father, Henry VIII. And they bring over 600 men on seven ships. And, of course, they rob the Spanish on the way over. They steal two ships from Spain out of the Caribbean. They also hit um, Puerto Rico and rob everybody there. And they steal some pigs and some cows and everything down to the door hinges. And they lost one ship in a storm to Portugal. And so they built another one in Puerto Rico. They still end up with seven ships arriving, but they don't all get here at the same time. The first ship to arrive was called the Red Lion, and it was the second biggest. And it went to Hatteras and dropped off 32 guys, or as they called it, Croatoan. And they waited around for 20 days for the rest of the fleet. The last ship to arrive was the Tiger along with the Elizabeth. So the Elizabeth II that sits in Mania, the replica ship, is a replica of um, the Elizabeth, which never actually went to Manio. But at any rate, um, the tiger wrecks at a place called Wakakon, which means he who flies around or spirits. That was today, Ocracoke. And so this wreck of the tiger off of Ocracoke, it doesn't sink. It just runs aground in shallow water. And to get off the bar, they throw the horses overboard. And that is apparently, possibly, maybe, where the Spanish Mustangs on Ocracoke come from. They do have Spanish Mustangs, but they got here via the English who stole them out of Puerto Rico. Um, they threw the cattle overboard, and they went, moo. Oh, that was dumb. Um, and they, they lost a lot of the sugar and a lot of the things they had stolen out of the Caribbean on the way over that they were counting on to pay back the leather investors. So the shipwreck's very influential. The leader, Richard Grenville, decides we've got to make up for our losses. So I'm going to take all of the ships and I'm going to leave and go raid the Spanish again. And he does and he gets a ship full of silver out of the Azores. But it's a very significant shipwreck because if it had not happened, then there wouldn't have been a change of command. Who he leaves behind is a total psychopath named Ralph Lane with 105 guys and Ralph Lane takes that beautiful relationship that they had with the Croatoan and the Secotin and he's he's good with the Croatoan but it goes completely sideways with the Secotin a cup is stolen a, one silver cup and he burns the entire village of Augusto Cop near Scranton North Carolina and the adjoining cornfields so when this happens um the relationship with the Secotin goes down the toilet and their chief his name is Wingina, and he kind of blames the croatoan because the croatoan he already hated anyway and they were egging the english on and telling them to do it they've been doing that since they met him in 1584. so when gina he sends ralph lane up the choan river where the croatoan chief is minitanin and the reason he's up there is because he was wounded fighting against Wingina's people, and he'd been shot three times with arrows, and he couldn't walk. He was lame because of it, and he was up in Chowan recovering. The Chowan Indians were allies with the Croatoan, and that whole area where Camden and Curry Tuck is today it was a weep of Mayoc, and they were allies with the Croatoan. But beyond that, up in Bertie were the Mandawag, who were allies with the Secretan. We'll get into that later. But Wingina, the Secretan chief, sends the English up there and says, you can get a lot of really big pearls if you go up there. You can get even better stuff, even better trade. That's the source of all these pearls, which was a lie. Then he sends word ahead to Minneton and says, these guys have, are coming up there to kill you. Let's just squash all our old beef and, you know, you should kill them. So he's trying to instigate a war between the Croatoan and the English. When the English get there, they see warriors gathered and they just open up on them with grape and they run off. When they meet Minotanin, he blames it all on Wingina and says, he told me you guys are coming up here to kill me. And um, Ralph Lane doesn't know who to believe. So he takes Minotanin's son, Skyco, with him back down the Chowan River as like ransom. And uh, while he was gone on that little adventure, the uh, 
Sacoton Indians and Man's Harbor near Roanoke Island are tearing up the fishing nets. They ain't killed anybody, but they're doing all kinds of pesky stuff. And Ralph Lane learns the truth because Minnetonin is sending him grain and feeding him, and the Croatoan are helping them. So he releases Skyco. He lets him go as he realizes who his real enemy is. And Skyco discovers a plot where when Gina wants to burn English houses at night and when they come running out without their armor, shoot them and kill them with arrows. And he tells Ralph Lane about it. So Ralph Lane decides to beat him to the punch. This is what the Sequitin think Ralph Lane looked like on the left. Um, he wants to beat him to the punch and ambush and kill Wingina, which he does. And the Croatoan are there. They help him do it. There's a line in Ralph Lane's own narrative written by his own hand where he says, I was careful watching for Manio and his friends to make sure none of them were hurt during this ambush. He shot uh, Wingina, who had changed his name at that point to Pemesipan. He changed it after his, bro his brother, Grangana Mayo, and his father, Insinor, died. Um, ironically, Insinor and Grangana Mayo were saying don't kill the English because if you do, they come back to life. They drain the life out of healthy warriors and they come back to life if you kill them because they're devils from Popogasso. And that's how they uh, made sense of all the English diseases that were killing people. Well, Insinor and Grand Ganameo both died of English diseases. So when they were gone, there was no one in the council to argue against killing the English. And when Gina wanted to kill them, and uh, so did Wanchis. So anyway, they, they ambushed Wingina. And it, Christ our victor was the ambush word for everybody to come out shooting. And they shot him in the back twice. And he still got up and ran. And then an Irishman named Edward Nugent cut his head off. Um, the English were starving pretty bad on Roanoke Island. They actually ate their own hunting dogs, these large mastiffs. So they had sent people to go live on Croatoan, not only to feed themselves because they had allies there that would feed them, but also to spot ships and look for help, not just from the English, but even from the Dutch who there were their allies. And they really lucked out. The, um, Captain there, his name was Edward Stafford, living on Hatteras. He spotted Francis Drake, who had just finished sailing around the world. He just sacked St. Augustine in Florida. And they flag him down with smoke. And um, Drake arrives, and what do you need? And uh, Ralph Lane tells him, I want gunpowder. I want healthy men. I want this. I want that. And Drake gives him everything he asked for and loads it up on a ship called the Francis, named after himself. And a storm hits as what ha happens in Hatteras a lot. And the only ship that's gone is the Francis. So he says, I'm not loading another ship with what you want. You want to come back to England with me or not? And after a lot of bad noise, Ralph Lane does reluctantly go back to England with Drake, but he blames the whole debacle on Grenville. If he'd only resupplied me earlier, we wouldn't have any of these problems. Had nothing to do with burning down a village or murdering a chief or kidnapping people. Like none of it was Ralph Lane's fault. It was all Grenville. And Ralph Lane had a huge chest of pearls swiped right out of his hands by a wave just before they left. That was, I think, Hatteras saying hello. Um, so he lost those. I'd like to find that one day. And they go back to England. Ironically, two weeks later, Grenville's resupply ships do show up. And they don't see anybody because Lane has already left. Now They decide to leave 15 guys on Roanoke Island to hold the fort like literally to hold the fort. And those 15 guys are walking into a wood chipper because the Sequitin are still extremely angry over what had happened. Their chief's been murdered, and they implement when Gina's old plan. They call out to these men. They smash one of them in the head with a club and kill him. They shoot one of them through the open mouth and out the back of his throat with an arrow and kill him. They light fire to their houses. The tops of the, the thatch roofs are easy, light on fire. And the guys come running out, and they don't have their armor on. And they, they run to the weapons house where they kept all their weapons, and they grab whatever came to hand, and they come back out, and they start fighting. There's only 15 of them, and two of them get killed in the first 30 seconds. So they do wound one Indian in the leg, and they end up piling into this little oyster boat, like a rowboat, and just drift off into the sound as fast as they can. 
And the natives don't pursue them. Instead, they just loot the fort and steal everything and celebrate. Now, the reason the Sacotin did this is because the English had burned down a village and murdered their chief and all that stuff. So your lost colony from 1587 is the first colony to bring women. It's the first one is not a military expedition. They wanted to go somewhere up the Chesapeake Bay area. They knew about the bay, not necessarily Chesapeake, but somewhere in the Chesapeake Bay like Jamestown did. And they are only stopping by Roanoke Island for one reason, and that's to pick up the 15 men that have been left there by Grenville in 1586 on the third voyage. So the fourth voyage, the Lost Colony, wants to pick these 15 men up. When they get there, they find a skeleton of one of the men um, that had been murdered. Just They didn't bury him or anything. They found a skeleton just sitting there on the beach, and sun-dried bones, they called it. And they didn't see any of the men. And they saw where the houses had melons in them. And there were deer inside eating the melons. So nobody had been there for a while. Because they got murked pretty much immediately. Um, when this happens, they're a little leery. And then one of your colonists, we know the fate of this guy, uh, at least. His name is George Howe. Was by himself crabbing. And they shot him 16 times with arrows. And then smashed his skull in like a pinata. The Sequitin did this. After, at that event, when they discovered Hal's brains all over the marsh and all the holes in his body from the arrows, they asked Manio, who's still with the English, he's been with them since 1584, to take 20 English guys to Croatoan to get help. So he does. They get to Croatoan, they're throwing a feast, and they're told, listen, we will go to the mainland and talk to them for you and see if we can smooth things over. And the English are happy about that. And they say, look, well, that's all good. But if we don't hear anything within a week, we're going to assume they're enemies and kill them all. A week goes by. They don't hear anything. So they go over to Man's Harbor or Dasakamonico. And the Croatoan have already sacked the town and run the Sequitin off. They're stealing all of the corn. They're stealing all the pumpkins. And they share this with the English. And the English say, look, this works too. Either if they don't want to be our friends, then fine, we're fine with this, just taking over their town and stealing their food. So they do. And they give the uh, Croatoan chief, Minotonin, is with the Croatoan again on Hatteras, and he's gone up to Man's Harbor with them to help loot it. And they give him a ride to Roanoke Island, and he witnesses Manio get baptized, and he witnesses Virginia Dare be born. And this is usually where the story starts, um, and everything I've been talking about is left out. The governor tells the colony, I'm going back for resupplies. If you leave, write down the name of where you're going on a tree or obvious place. And if you leave for danger, carve a cross underneath it. John White goes back to England. It takes him three years to get back. The first year, the Spanish Armada attacked and he, well, no ships were allowed to leave. The second year, he does leave and John White gets attacked on his way and he's shot in the uh, butt and stabbed in the head with a pike and slashed in the side with a sword. So they they got in a fight with another ship, a French one actually, on the way out, and they win, but they have so many wounded they turn around and drop the wounded off, which White was one of them. He recovers from that, and he basically he's so desperate he hitchhikes with pirates. He's got one friend on board called Edward Spicer, and they go to spend over a month pirating people in the Caribbean, and then they very reluctantly stop by Roanoke to check on this colony. And when they do, no ship can go to Roanoke because it's surrounded by shallow sounds. So they have to get off in these little boats and go through the inlet. And when they're doing that, seven of them drowned, including Spicer. And at that point, there's a mutiny. They're like, we're not going to take you. You know, your buddy's dead. We're sick of this because seven other guys drowned and they're all saddened by it. And White begs them, let me try again. And they let him do it. And he takes 19 guys and he tries again. And this time they're able to get through the inlet to Roanoke Island. They get there. Of course, they see Croatoan on the tree. There's nothing mysterious about it. They know exactly what that means because the English had lived on Croatoan in 1584 and in 85. And even in 87, they'd gone down there and had a meal. So they've been going back and forth to Croatoan for years. So White says, that the next morning it was agreed by the captain, myself, and others to weigh anchor and go for the place at Croatoan where our planners were. That's exactly what he said. So they start off to go to Croatoan and they get hit by a hurricane. 
They're blown 23 miles out to sea. They lose all of their anchors except for one. And it, and without the anchors, it's very hard to navigate near land. And the, the crew was already, they'd already had a, a near mutiny before this. And after this, they're like, look, man, we don't care about you or your colony. We're going home. And it whites powerless to do anything about it. And they actually wreck at um, Ireland. They don't even make it all the way back. And, you know, it's, it's kind of unfortunate because they were so close to reconnecting and they didn't. Nobody ever looked for the colony again um, until 2009 when we started to dig in the most obvious location, which would be the Croatoan Indian villages, um, who have always maintained that the colony lived there. Uh, we have John Lawson, who um, met the, the Hatteras tribe, which is the Croatoan, who told them that their ancestors were white people who could speak out of a book. And, and they even mentioned Sir Walter Raleigh by name. So this map is by John White and Croatoan is clearly labeled. They even give the latitude of the inlets. You can kind of see Madame Mesquite Lake on the mainland across there and Waka Connors, Ocracoke. They always knew where it was. Um, White did report, I was deeply joyful for a certain token of safe arrival at Croatoan, where the savages of that island are our friends and where Manny was born. So he's telling you it's an island. It's an island on the map. They mentioned it as an island three times in the same document. It talks about Virginia Dare being born. Yet we learn in school and no one knows what the word means. And that's got to stop. Um, so there's Lawson. What do we find? All right. The oldest thing, I'll start with the oldest and run through it. The oldest thing we found is a Cumberland spearhead, which is 11,000 B.C. So... That's older than the pyramids at Giza. And we also found walrus tusk and bison head. And it, Hatteras Island apparently back then was a lot colder. And um, that is at the tail end of the last ice age. So we, that's ridiculous old. And we don't really even know what language these guys spoke. We just know that they were on the island and hunting with spears. Uh, this is a Savannah Riverhead point, which is only 3,000 years old only. And on the right is some pottery from Frisco, and it's from the mid-woodland period, and that's from about the year 500. So that's – we're moving through time pretty quickly. Uh, we went and did a, a dig behind Cape Hatteras School just to kind of demonstrate the process of archaeology, and the kids lucked out. We were sitting there explaining to them how to dig and how we did it, and the kid goes, what's that? And we look in, and there's a piece of pottery, and we end up getting more. And all of this pottery on the left – was found by middle school kids um, and then they took it inside to the school and they fit together and they were to goop, goop it together and make part of this pot. On the right is um, some African ware, colonial ware it's called and it's from where the, the Indians were harboring a slave apparently and that's from the 1700s though it wasn't very deep underground. Um, two unrelated stories but this is what Hatteras Island looks like today is people in their mind, they imagine what they see when they drive through, and you drive through Pea Island is nothing but sand. That's not the case once you get to Croatoan. Croatoan is just Buxton, Frisco, and Hatteras Village. It's not the rest of the island. It's very healthy. It's a maritime forest. You can grow whatever you want there, um, even lemons. Um, my dad grew corn in our backyard. So this, this mythology that nothing grows there and you would have to split up is just asinine. Um, these are post holes from a longhouse, from a native longhouse with a little fire pit there. This longhouse, I don't know how far it goes because it ran right into the section wall, probably another 20 feet. This is a, a pipe stem. It kind of has a back end like a Cadillac and some English ware. I think it's border ware or something. We get tons of that stuff. Um, this is a glass arrowhead photo by National Geographic. And this is very interesting that these pretentious items are repurposed to make more functional items. You got earrings that turn into fish hooks. And in this case, this glass was from very, very high uh, falutin glass. So we have a XRF machine that can tell you the elemental makeup of anything in the world. And you just zap it like a price gun. And this had a lot of potassium and not very much lead. And it was um, expensive glass. They can even tell where in the world it was made by the elemental makeup, which is amazing to me. And it's some science that I don't understand and I'm not going to pretend to. But um, this was also near a, a woman uh, or a skeleton. This is a 
writing slate with a pencil or more on that later. Um, NASA looked at it. There's, I'll, I'll talk about that later. Uh, some pipe bowls with some cool designs. This is some Germanic where this is 16th century. This is 16th century. Nuremberg token, 16th century. The pipe bowls are not. They are from the 1650s. Um, and when you get free of the pipe bowls, because there's so many of them, when you don't have any more of those, you don't have any more of these Venetian glass beads, then you, you know you're getting onto a new level. This is a big copper fitting around a, um, a tree branch that broke. And there's another token with holes drilled in it. The tokens are a very, very special story. I'm going to tell at the end because that is the coolest story of all of the stories. This is one of our digs, again, from Nat Geo took that photo. And you can't really see it, but all those, there's, it's full of hundreds of um, plastic red spoons that we got from the dollar store. The red showed up better. And we needed to mark where post holes were and different features. And we kept sending um, these kids from Ireland up to Avon to get, because Buxton didn't have a dollar store back then, up to get um, plastic spoons and forks, but they had to be red. And they bought the entire supply of red ones. And uh, the store is very confused as to why all these kids from England and Ireland kept coming in every hour and getting more because we kept finding more post holes. Anyway, a silly kind of story. Um, is some of the pipes. I like the starfish one. There's a, they usually have animals on them. Sometimes like a, um, a water moccasin snake. Uh, there's a lot of them with the starfish. There's a lot of uh, just different animals and things. Um Here's some more. These are all 16th century items here. Um, what what we found in the beginning, of course, you go through and you get like a Sony Walkman. You know you're in the 1980s and you, you keep going through the Civil War and all that mess and you get down to the 1600s. And there are a handful of 16th century items in the 1600s, which makes sense that people held on to them for a few years. Um whether they were native or they were colonists that were still alive and it gets who knows, but um, there are some items from the 1500s found in the 1600s layer. But what you really need is a layer that's purely from the 1500s. And we found that too. So this is actually a, a rapier. It's a, a handle from a rapier, which is a sword. And if you look very faint, there's a, a heart and a cross underneath the heart and that was actually little tiny flakes of silver that were still on the sword if you look at it today you can't see it because they're covered with this special wax to keep um, air from getting at them and the wax is kind of the same color as the cross in the um, heart but that's why we photo all of it before we put it in here's another fitting with two hearts going together and it's a hook and eye closure on the right it's all lost colony stuff um, this is, was found by my great, great grandfather or no, my great grandfather Estes White. And it is a olive jar and it's identical to the ones they get in St. Augustine. It's 16th century for sure, but it, um, it's not necessarily English because the Spanish and French use these two considering everything else we found around it. It, it is English, but when he found it, um, it was a little unclear and it once had olive oil in it which is very important to the English because they used it to process wool, which was their number one export at the time. This is the famous signet ring. It's bronze. It's got a lion on it. It's found by Dr. Phelps in the 90s. It's from the 16th century, but that was found in a layer of about 1650. So it's a cool item, but it wasn't found in that, that pure layer that you want of just 1500 stuff. Same thing with a gun log. It dates to 1583, but it was found in a layer of about 1640. Um, this is one of our trenches. You actually look close. You can see a well with a barrel in it. There's a fob seal. This is a piece of eight like you hear. It's pure silver. Um, it's actually a piece of a piece of eight. This is an English hay penny. These, these were found in some pirate's house um, from the 1700s. We called them that because he had so many brandy bottles and gun flints. The... Long pipe that's kind of bone colored is English and it's Kalen. And then the two sort of orange ones are Croatoan or Hatteras Indian pipes. They have a lot bigger bowls. Um, there's a key. There's some slipware, some metallic stuff. There's the brandy bottle on the right. Um, lots and lots of brandy on the island. People were heavy drinkers back then. That's one of the most common things we find besides bullets, um, lead shot. So 
we get some we get down to 1600s and it's really easy when you find coin weights that say 1644 on them and we got three of those and we got some snipped glass and that actually ends up being 16th century as well um, i'll get into that later these are venetian trade beads very very easily datable to the 1640s and 50s once we get free of those which we had literally thousands of um, we know we're in a new layer is a pocket watch key, which I just thought was neat to be able to find this long later. Here's some 16th century stuff. This comes out of that pure layer um, is a gun barrel. It's been smashed. Obviously, they repurposed the gun barrel. There's a, a iron spike, which we all joked was what killed Edward II and some lead shot and you can see some of the lead shot is screwed up and, and that's where they were making it and messed up and um, over poured the mold or whatever um, because they were actually making lead shot on the island and we found the whole smithy where they were doing that um, these are just some post holes of a, of a longhouse this is a copper bun and it is from the lost colony it's two inches thick it's about the size of a nerf football if it was complete um they we found the fire bar we found where they were making this copper we found the post holes and everything where this workshop was set up in the indian village which i thought was interesting it's surrounded by longhouses and are all the same depth and and the same um layer that 1500s layer so it was a beautiful find um the nuremberg token I, i'll go ahead and tell that story now so nick knowles from the bbc was down with dr horton who's our leader and myself and we went to Roanoke Island and we did a tour and asked them what was the best evidence they had of the colony and they showed us these three tokens and they said these are the best evidence this Nuremberg token is very dateable and blah 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 one of them had been found on Hatteras Island in the 1930s and it was found by my fourth grade teacher's dad who is named Tandy and that was the first token found and it was identical to one of the tokens that they had on Roanoke and Roanoke had three of them. So it was a nice tie between the islands, but the way that he found it, he's just a regular guy and found it, you know, after a storm or whatever. So it's not really archeology span because you don't know when it got there is definitely from the 16th century, but when did it get to the island? And the ones on Roanoke had a problem too, because they were making the fort, the fort that you see called Fort Raleigh, is not 400 years old they built it in the 1950s with a backhoe and when they were doing that is when they found their tokens so that kind of is makes it to where well you know when did they get here we found one in contacts in the 1500s layer pure which kind of validates the other four and it was identical to the other two tokens on road in other words the <laughs> The odds of these tokens not being from the same source are astronomical. And the one that we found in Buxton and contacts is definitely from the colony from the 1580s, which means the other three probably are too. And it's a nice little tie between the two islands. This Germanic stoneware. It's just 16th century. There's a fire bar on the top is before electrolysis. That's what iron looks like when it's been underground for 430 years. And then on the bottom is what it looks like after you get all of the iron off. And you do that with electricity and a bucket of water with this um, solution. It's basically the same thing as a pH up for a hot tub. <laughs> and uh, and then you there's a whole long process that I don't want to bore you with. But anyway, that's what it looks like when it's cleaned up. And that's part of the smithy that they're making the copper is a silver ring. Copper anglet, those are actually for fancy pants uh, shoelaces. And that was the other great find they had on Roanoke Island. And we've got 14 of them now from Hatteras Island. It's another tie between the two. So this is one of our one of our pits. And you look and you can see the layers. Um, the black is kind of good, but not great. And then below that is like all black full of shells. And that's the good, good stuff where all the great finds are. Um, the writing slate ended up having a picture of a man on it shooting an Indian in the back. Um, they found a writing slate in Jamestown as well that had drawings on it. They would write and draw on paper, and they had this lead slate behind it, and it would pick up the drawings as it's kind of accidentally scratched, you know, on the to the lead. So you get overlapping 
text and overlapping drawings, but you can still make it out. Thank you, NASA. There's a rapier again, and this is what they look like when they're whole. It's called a swept hilt, swept hilt rapier. Um, these are our very serious crew, you know, um, one of the years anyway. They're all different all of the time. We got a ton of sponsors on the island. A lot of businesses help. We didn't get any grants from anybody. Everything is done on the island by island businesses. A uh, little couple businesses from up the beach, Home Depot, for example. Um, but it's mostly just, just local businesses like Connors and Orange Blossom and uh, Global Surf Network out of Virginia did help us. But um, without the community, we would not be able to do these digs. Those are the middle school kids that <laughs> lucked out and found a bunch of stuff right behind the school. And has Dr. Horton on the top, and he's posing with the kids as well. The colony left one more message. This is actually from a protest to keep the beaches open. Is there all cars? Or please help us. The last day the point was open before they shut it down. It's open again now. It was closed for four years because you're hurting birds and turtles. Um, but uh, if you that was only if you went out there for free. If you pay a, a fine to the park service and watch a video, then you can go back out there. Because you're only hurting them if you go out there for free. Make sure everybody understands that. If you pay the park service money, you're no longer hurting them and you can go back out. So that's all I have for you for the slideshow. And I'll, I guess I'll open it up to questions now. You know, am I live on You're live, Facebook? Alan. Uh, you hear me. I'm wondering I if the rest so. of the world hears me. Because I'm going, if so, I'm going to invite folks to ask questions uh, in the comment section. All right, Seamus, do you have any questions? Beautiful. All right, then. Well, uh, we are not getting questions uh, in our comment section. So, Scott, thank you very much for a uh, wonderful presentation, informative presentation. Uh, I did get a couple of comments that I uh, I saw that were along the lines of we need some for rewrites sure. of our textbooks so uh, uh, to make them uh, more current. So thank you again. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we will see you hopefully. Uh, on the 18th. All right, for thanks our for having music me. Special. Thank you, Scott.